All right, so I'll tell you just a little bit about some of the research projects that we're doing. Um, and I should say, you know, these are the ones that I'm presenting, but did you hear from Dr. Samowski already about some of the things we're doing together? And really, I think the best thing about the center is that everyone works together as a team. And it's just a really wonderful environment to, uh, to work in and to do research in. So I'll tell you, we have, we have tons and tons of projects, obviously. But I'm going to tell you about just a, a few to focus on. So the ones I'm going to talk about are our pilot trial of a dietary intervention for MS, uh, the role of the gut microbiome in MS. I'm going to spend most of the time on those two, and then I'll tell you just a little bit about uh, a project that we're close to finishing, our mitochondrial dysfunction project, and then uh, a little bit about neuromyelitis optica research. So starting with our diet trial, so I'll give you a little bit of background. So the first question is, why are we interested in diet? Right, because this is something that sometimes comes up when we're looking for funding is, you know, why are we looking at this? So the first thing is MS patients are really interested in this topic. So many of you, I'm sure, have thought about this or asked about it during, you know, asked your doctor about it. I think it's really important because this is something that people can, can do that is something that is positive for them to really take an active role in their own health as opposed to something that um, the doctor is just telling you to do and taking pills and things like that. And I think it has an appeal as a more natural approach. But I think the thing that really has made this work possible is that there has been increasing scientific rationale over the last <coughs> few years. So we're learning a lot about MS. There's still a lot that we don't know, but we know that there's a very strong environmental component to the disease. We also know that people, once they have the disease, behave differently, right? Some patients are very mildly affected, some patients are very severely affected, and we don't really understand all of the factors that contribute to that. So this is one thing that, that we're interested in. Um, but I think even more importantly, th thinking about disease mechanisms, there are, there's a lot more research recently. Um, some really beautiful work done one of our, by one of our colleagues in Boston published just a few weeks ago that really demonstrates mechanistic connections between metabolites that are, that are produced uh, by diet, by things actually in the foods themselves, um, as well as molecules that are produced by the gut microbiota, the bacteria that live in the gut, and I'll talk a little bit about that. So as I'm sure many of you know, and I see some heads nodding here, there's a lot of popular diets to choose from, and these are the th ones that people often ask us about. But every single one of these books is totally different, right? So people often come in and say, well, I heard about the Walls diet, and I heard about, you know, George Jelinek's diet, and which is the right diet? So my question then is, well, what's the evidence? And the answer is that there isn't any. So why isn't there any? So these are some of the barriers. I'll talk quickly about these in terms of, I think, why the research hasn't been done before. So this is something that I thought about when I first got into this line of work. When I was actually a trainee, I thought about this a lot because patients were asking us constantly, and we were just constantly saying, we just don't know. And I thought, why has anyone done this? And then when I started trying to design some work, these are some of the issues that, that we ran into that we're trying to address now with our study. So the first thing is, is recruitment even feasible? So patients say they're interested in this, but when it's actually time to sign up for a study, are people actually going to sign up for it and say, yes, I'm willing to make this really big change. It's going to be really difficult, but I'm actually going to do it. So that was a very big question. And then are people going to be able to follow a diet that we give? Are they going to really stick to it? And how can we help them stick to it? Can we even measure if they're sticking to it or not? So are there biological markers that we can use in the blood and things like that? Um, and issues when we uh, measure adherence by having patients just report it to us, right? Because people are not always accurate in, in assessing their own diet. Thinking about an appropriate control group. So whenever we do a study, we like to have a randomized study, right? Where, and we like to have a control group where we assign one group to follow the intervention and one group to not follow the intervention so we can see if there are differences. And is that something that we can really do in a study on diet, right? It's very different than when you assign two groups to taking pills or not taking pills and no one knows what they're getting, right? This is, this is very, very different than that. So to that point, you can't blind people to which group they're in. Everyone obviously knows which group they're in, if they're changing their diet or not. And so that has issues, right, in terms of collecting information. What diet should we study? Should we be studying the Walls diet? Should we be studying our own diet that we come up with? How do we know which pieces of the diet are a good idea or not a good idea? Should the food be prepared by the study? Should, this be, should it be a thing where we actually give the food and say, this is what you eat? Or should it, this be something that um, people prepare on their own? 
And then just thinking about how to measure whether the study is effective. So what kinds of endpoints should we be looking at in the study, right? A study always has to have a point at the end of it. What are we trying to measure? And it's, it's really hard to think about these things. So we came up with this pilot study of a dietary intervention for MS. And the study is actually almost complete. So we randomly assigned 36 women with MS to either follow this diet that we developed or to not follow this diet. And to come up with this dietary intervention, um, what we did was really just review what literature was available, and there's really not a lot, but things that were done, for example, in animal models, uh, in very small studies in people, whatever we could kind of piece together to give us our best guess at what would be a good diet for MS. And so the diet we came up with is pretty strict, no meat, no dairy, it encourages foods that are high in poly and monounsaturated fats, high in fiber, like fruits and vegetables and whole grains, and basically completely eliminates processed foods. We limited salt as well. And to do this, we had intensive training with myself and our nutritionist for the study. We gave out a lot of handouts and recipes and grocery lists for suggestions. We had meetings to go over how things were going. Um, we did uh, assessments of adherence to the diet every month with a couple of different ways. And then we um, took blood and urine samples actually to try to look at some biological markers, which we've yet to analyze. And then just preliminarily, we want to see what the effects are in terms of people's general health and wellness and then uh, effects on MS. So does it help people, for example, with their symptoms like fatigue or does it help people feel like they have a better quality of life? And then we also collected uh, some specimens, uh, stool specimens um, and blood specimens that are kind of to be analyzed a little bit later. But this was the idea behind the study. And um, the study is wrapping up right about now, actually. We're just about done with it. So hopefully next time I talk to you guys, I can have some results to report to you. So we'll see. And I should mention that this has been funded by the National MS Society. OK, so now we'll talk a little bit about the gut microbiome, a, rela a very related topic. Are people familiar with the idea of microbiota? Sounds like a lot of people are. So um, this is something that's really come up a lot lately, and I think people probably have heard about it in the news and things as, a, as kind of a hot topic. But basically, we all have bacteria living all over us, inside and out. It's not a nice thing to think about, but they're there. And uh, for the most part, they're there for good reason, right? We've co-evolved with these bacteria over many, many years, and they perform a lot of really important functions for us, like helping us digest our food. Um, there are trillions of bacteria in the gut. So what we've learned more recently is not only do those bacteria fulfill those roles, but they have really important influences on the immune system. So about 70 to 80% of the body's entire immune system is actually inside the gut. And what happens inside the gut is really important in terms of influence on the rest of the immune system in the body and therefore what happens inside the central nervous system. So there's been a lot of work done recently on the microbiota and connections to autoimmunity. So just to show you a little schematic of this and not to get too much into the hard science of it, but this is a, this is a little picture of what it would look like kind of under the microscope inside the intestine. And um, so you can see that there's you know, food and bacteria and stuff kind of passing through and then there's the wall of the intestine. And then the zoom in part here actually shows you that there are uh, interactions between what comes through the intestine and the immune cells that live there. And those immune cells, when they're, when they're born, kind of when they're young, they can either grow up to be immune cells that are pro-inflammatory, which can cause autoimmune disease, we think, or they can be anti-inflammatory and kind of dampen, dampen things. And so you can see how it might be important to say, you know, okay, what's the identity of the different bacteria living there? Do people with MS have different bacteria than people without MS? And is that something that either is one of the factors that leads to the onset of MS, or even if it, if it does or it doesn't, but what about during the disease course? And is that something we could actually use to our advantage, right? So could we somehow do some intervention that would make people with MS have bacteria that are, that are more anti-inflammatory? And could that help control the disease? So these are some of the things that we're thinking about. So we are part of a, a fairly uh, large project, started with a collaboration between our group here at Mount Sinai and a group in California at UCSF. 
and we're funded by the National MS Society as well as the Department of Defense and a private grant to UCSF. And um, we collect, uh, some of you may have participated in this or had friends who participated in this study, but it's ongoing. Um, and so we collect blood and stool from our patients as well as a lot of clinical information. Um, and that all gets processed and ends up at a data analysis core at um, University of California, San Diego. And then that data comes back to us and we are working on correlating patterns that we find to um, pieces of clinical information about our patients. There's also a pretty interesting um, mouse part. I'm not a mouse researcher, but um, the models that, that we look at are really important. I'll tell you a little bit about one of those experiments. So um, this is the first paper that we put out as a group in the fall. Um, and what we showed is that there were very clear differences between people with MS and people without MS in terms of the gut bacteria. And um, what we were able to show is, so these three plots that you can see on the top part here, you can see where it says control and MS, and those are different levels of very particular types of bacteria, and you can see that there are differences, right, in the levels between people with MS and people without MS. So that was kind of the first step. And then further steps in this paper were able to show that um, some of the bacteria that seem to be increased in people with MS seem to favor inflammation, whereas bacteria that were down in people with MS were ones that actually were anti-inflammatory. So it seemed like the MS patients didn't have as much of that bacteria as maybe they, as maybe they should have or as, as much as people who didn't have MS. So we thought that was kind of interesting. Then on the bottom, getting to the mouse part of it, which I think is actually kind of interesting, what um, our group at Caltech did there was they actually took uh, stool samples that we had collected from patients and they put them into mice. And so what you can see on that bottom panel is um, a disease score along the side with a uh, higher score indicating worse disease. And so they basically give the mice a mouse version of MS. And um, before they did that, they actually transplanted stool from our patients as opposed to from a control or from a, uh, from a mouse, uh, mice that were grown up in an environment with no bacteria. And um, so when they gave them the mouse MS, you can see the differences in the scores. And the red one being the one that came from an MS patient. And you can see that those mice actually had much worse version of mouse MS than the mice that um, received stool from the control and that was even worse than the mice that were grown up in a germ-free environment. So we think that this work is pretty interesting. Um, so we think this work is pretty interesting and something that we definitely want to explore further. So our research on microbiota is ongoing. We're part of a consortium that is aiming to enroll 2,000 people with MS along with household controls over the next year or so, and we're hoping to get a lot of information from that, not only about microbiota in MS patients compared to people without MS, but also to learn more about the effects of medications and uh, the effects of diet and all kinds of things. So if anyone wants to be part of that, let us know. I'll tell you just briefly about these other two projects. So our mitochondrial project. So I'll show you first, this is a hypothetical model of um, nerve damage that happens in MS. So I'm sure everyone is familiar with the ideas and some of the ideas that we've been talking about here in terms of autoimmunity and models of inflammation. <coughs> but really, it's not just the inflammation that makes the nerve cells sick and makes them die and makes people really get sick over time. There's this underlying neurodegenerative process that in some ways is related to inflammation, and you see that here kind of at the beginning, but in this model, there's a lot of other pieces you can see that happen kind of later on. And one of the big things that you can see in the middle there is mitochondrial damage and dysfunction. So is anyone familiar with the, with the term mitochondria? Does anyone remember that from high school biology? So mitochondria is kind of what's described as the powerhouse of the cell, right? It's the part of the cell that makes the energy. And so you can imagine that's really important. Over time, if the mitochondria do not function well, they do not produce enough energy, you can imagine that the cells would get sick and eventually they would die. There's a lot of changes that happen in the cells in terms of um, different ion channels moving around and the cell just not working efficiently when there's a chronic energy insufficiency. And so our project 
um, is to try to study that mechanism further in MS. You can imagine that it's really hard to do um, because it's something that requires looking at cells inside the brain and we can't do that easily in patients who are alive, <laughs> right? We're not just going to start taking pieces of people's brains. So it doesn't work. So there's a lot of work that's been done in animal models. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about the project that we're doing. So we've actually completed enrollment. We enrolled the study about two years ago. The idea was to focus on progressive MS and do comparisons to relapsing MS. And so we enrolled 15 patients with relapsing MS, 15 with primary progressive, and 17 with secondary progressive. We were, our aim was to get 45, but we had two people on the secondary progressive group who had incomplete data, so we, that's why we did two more. So we collected from all of our participants spinal fluid, uh, a research MRI, which included some really interesting new sequences that we, we think will be helpful in progressive MS. We did detailed clinical assessments, and then we also did skin biopsies to generate stem cells from all of our patients. And what we've done so far is we've started looking at what happens when we take that spinal fluid from our patients and we put it on neurons, so nerve cells that we can grow in cultures. Actually, we use ones that are, that are um, grown from human, human cells, not only from rat cells, because we were talking about some issues with animal models. And we look to see what happens if we take spinal fluid from MS patients and we put it on those neurons, what happens to the mitochondria? We're trying to get at um, is, is there something in the spinal fluid that it, in MS patients have that is kind of toxic to the nerve cells and that's making the mitochondria sick? So that's kind of the idea behind a big piece of this project. And so we've done some work on that already, kind of finishing that part of it up. Um, and it, it does look pretty interesting. It definitely looks like our patients who have progressive MS, um, their spinal fluid seems to cause a worse dysfunction in the mitochondria in those cells as compared to people, for example, with relapsing MS who are stable. So we think that'll be pretty interesting. We're also doing a detailed analysis of what's in the CSF, <laughs> it's something that people have done many times over, but we're kind of giving this another look based on some preliminary data we had from an earlier study. And then I mentioned stem cells, so we've generated different lines of cells um, from our patients that we got from the skin biopsies. We can actually grow those into neurons, and then we can study them in terms of the mitochondria and seeing how the mitochondria function. So we're just finishing up the study over the next few months. We're collecting our follow-up data, which is a two-year follow-up time point from the beginning. So we'll be able to see how patients did over the two years and then link that up with all of the CSF data and the MRI data that we collected. So hopefully we'll have some results to report probably in early in 2019, I would guess. Lastly, I'll just tell you a very little bit about neuromyelitis optica research. So I'm not sure if anyone here is familiar with this disease, NMO. If anyone, I know some, some of our patients have NMO, but it's a more rare, much more rare disease than MS. Um, so it doesn't sound like uh, people here probably have heard too much about it, but um, it's also an autoimmune disease that affects the nervous system. And um, the patients actually can be really severely affected. And it's another area where we know a little bit, but we don't know a lot. But there's important overlap, I think, between MS and NMO in terms of being autoimmune diseases that affect the nervous system. And so it's something else that our center does. Um, and it's one, been a, one of my uh, focus areas for research also. Um, so we did a little pilot study of cetirizine, which you may know as Zyrtec, which is a you know, over-the-counter allergy medicine in patients with NMO as an add-on to their current therapies. And we think, it's, we think it's, it's pretty interesting. We did just a very small pilot study, but we found that our patients tolerated it well, had no major issues with it, um, and it, it, may, it may help. So something we're thinking about exploring further. And then I'll just finish by telling you that we are part of a large collaborative project that collects long-term data on patients in NMO. And I think one of the nicest things about that, being part of that, is that I think there's a lot of lessons that we can learn in MS in terms of how to collect longitudinal data on, on patients, which is something we really would like to do in MS. We think it's, it's really important. So with that, I will again thank you all so much for your attention. Any questions? Questions? Yeah.